You slept 10 hours and still woke up exhausted. You're not alone. In this video, I'll show you how to fix that properly. The last video I did on fatigue got a huge response from patients, from clinicians, from people who just couldn't understand why they were still tired, even after nine, 10, and sometimes 12 hours of sleep. And here's what I realized. Most people don't need more sleep. They need to know why their brain isn't resting. Because fatigue isn't just about low energy. It's about dysregulated circuits that stay stuck, even when your eyes are closed. And after that last video, the most common question was, okay, but Dr. Rege, how do you fix it? You see, before we fix anything, we have to dissect it. The brain is circuit driven. There's no shortcut. That's what this video is about. Not general advice, but the clinical framework I use to match medication and therapy to the exact profile in front of me. So here's what we're gonna cover. Why fatigue isn't just tiredness. How hyperarousal sabotages deep sleep. And how different brain circuits, emotional, cognitive, reward-based, interact to produce it and how we treat them. This isn't about labeling you with depression or burnout. It's about a clinical reasoning process, a diagnostic hierarchy that links symptoms to biology and then to treatment. I'm Dr. Sunil Rege, consultant, psychiatrist, and educator. When someone says I'm tired all the time, we don't just default to psychological causes. We don't start with assumptions. We start with a diagnostic hierarchy. We rule out what must be ruled out. Organic causes first. Iron deficiency, thyroid dysfunction, B12 folate, vitamin D deficiencies, inflammatory or autoimmune markers, sleep apnea, metabolic issues, even post-viral syndromes or long COVID. Why? Because these conditions masquerade as psychiatric fatigue. Next on the hierarchy, substances. Here we think about alcohol, caffeine stimulants. Why? Because alcohol fragments REM sleep. Caffeine disrupts low wave sleep. Stimulants, recreational or prescribed, push dopamine hard only to crash it later. Then we think about medications that are prescribed. SSRIs can blunt dopamine signaling. Mood stabilizers or antipsychotic medications can overly sedate the prefrontal cortex. Even helpful medications can sometimes backfire in the wrong circuit if the wrong dose is prescribed. Then we enter psychiatric territory, not with a label, but with functional questions. We think about sleep. Is their REM sleep disrupted? Are they dreaming vividly? Are they waking exhausted despite sleeping through the night? And finally, the most critical question, how is their arousal system functioning? Because when rest doesn't restore, it's time to look at the brain's arousal system. This brings us to the mesolimbic system. The mesolimbic system, part of the salience network, governs what your brain tags as important. It mediates arousal, reward, pain, and pleasure. And when it's dysregulated, everything starts to feel important, even when it's not. Everything becomes loud. This is the same circuit we see dysregulated in mania, OCD, post-traumatic stress disorder, ADHD, and early psychosis. But it's not binary. This system lies on a spectrum of activation. At the subtle end, inner restlessness, irritability, low frustration tolerance. In the middle, rumination, racing thoughts, emotional instability presenting as mood swings. As it goes further up, agitation, decreased need for sleep, grandiosity, even early psychotic features. And every step upward consumes more dopamine, noradrenaline, and cognitive bandwidth. The higher up the spectrum you go, the more cognitive fuel you burn. And the paradox, the more wired the brain becomes, the more exhausted the person feels. So yes, you can be hyper aroused and fatigued at the same time, wired and tired. Fatigue isn't always about low arousal. It's sometimes about unsustainable arousal. So after looking at medical causes, substances, medication, the mesolimbic system, then we look at the ACE model. The ACE model consists of activity, cognition, and emotion. So let's look at activity. 
Is the person able to do daily tasks? Do they initiate or only respond? Cognition? What's the quality of attention, memory, clarity, focus? Any brain fog? Disorganization? Emotion? What's the tone? Flat? Anxious? Volatile? Each of these is regulated by dopamine and noradrenaline loops through the prefrontal cortex and the striatum, the part of the brain responsible for cognition and activity. When this loop is compromised, what we call the frontostriatal circuit, we see brain fog, slow processing, poor memory recall, reduced motivation, emotional overreactions, or numbing. What often presents as fatigue is actually a collapse in cognitive emotional regulation. You're not just tired, your executive brain can't control the noise. And here's the catch, the same frontostriatal system is supposed to regulate arousal. So once it's overwhelmed, you lose both focus and control, a double hit. Now, let's zoom out further. Why do some people develop this pattern? Because many have lived this way for years, from childhood. They were the responsible one, the overachiever, the one who held it all together. And what did their nervous system learn? Stay alert, don't rest, stay ready. That's the origin of the wired, tired brain. A nervous system that got wired for threat detection and never unlearned it. Here we see guilt when resting, emotional suppression, high functioning perfectionism, and eventually burnout. We call this allostatic load, the cost of chronic adaptation. And it's measurable in the form of raised inflammatory markers, sleep fragmentation, increased pain sensitivity, HPA axis dysfunction in the form of cortisol imbalance. So if your body feels inflamed and your mind foggy, you're not imagining it. It's the biology of burnout. Fatigue then isn't imagined. It's the brain saying, I'm protecting you, please slow down. Now that we understand the origins of the fatigue, let's get to solutions. Treatment isn't one size fits all because fatigue isn't one circuit. Fatigue is a traffic jam in multiple neural lanes. The fix is to clear each lane in order so that the whole system can move again. So I use a four lane model. Lane one, calm the hyper alert brain. This is about sleep and salience. So how do we improve sleep and arousal regulation? Here are some options. When it comes to medication, we have medications such as prazosin, anywhere between one milligram to 10 milligrams at nighttime. This can treat nightmares through alpha adrenergic blockade. We have clonidine or guanfacine. This calms the locus ceruleus, the brain's internal alarm system. Then we have agents such as gabapentin and pregabalin, which should be used cautiously, but this adds a GABA-like breaking, especially helpful when pain's involved. We have other antihistaminergic agents that again should be used at the appropriate dose. Non-medication strategies include CBTI and sleep hygiene, same wake time, light exposure, and circadian anchoring. We may need treatment for trauma-related hyperarousal. This includes imagery rehearsal therapy or EMDR or trauma-focused CBT. This rewrites the amygdala's fear loops at night. The key here is that unless the alarm is silent, the repair crew can't pave the road. This takes us to lane two. Once the alarms quieten down, we now move to supporting the prefrontal cortex. Here think dopamine and noradrenaline support, not flooding. Here medications such as modafinil or armodafinil, these are wake promoting agents without the amphetamine like crash. Bupropion works when low mood and inertia intertwine. We have stimulants such as dexamphetamine or methylphenidate. Atomoxetine is another non-stimulant that can steady the prefrontal cortex tone. Important to consider iron. Ensure adequate levels of ferritin. Treat vitamin D deficiency. Ensure that TSH is at the right sweet spot because small biochemical tweaks, a big mitochondrial payoff. Non-medication strategies include task splitting or micro goals. 
these shrink cognitive load. Unpredictability is kryptonite for an exhausted prefrontal cortex. So therefore, introducing smart lifestyle levers can help. Brisk morning exercise upregulates D2 receptors. Mediterranean diet inclusion, here polyphenols, dampen neuroinflammation. And strategic caffeine, pre-noon only. The key to remember here is cognitive chaos is solved by structured, regulated circuits, not through willpower and pushing oneself. Lane three, reconnect the reward circuit. Here we're addressing anhedonia and a motivation, and therefore we move into the striatum. Strategies such as behavioral activation are simple and pack a punch. Here introduce pleasure and mastery tracking. This reminds the striatum what good feels like. Bright light therapy, 10,000 lux and waking. This helps with the circadian reward sinking. Address inflammation, a range of options, NAC being one of them. The key to remember here is when the brain forgets what good feels like, we need to remind it. And finally, we come to lane four. Here, we correct the developmental wiring. It's all about safety and meaning. So go bottom up before top down. Options include somatic experiencing, sensory motor psychotherapy, breath work, building body-based safety. Then one can layer schema focus CBT or acceptance commitment therapy to remap narratives. For perfectionistic or OCD traits, weave in metacognitive therapy. Teach the brain it can drop the mental spreadsheet without catastrophe. Personality dynamics, frame them as survival strategies, not flaws. Therapy aims to add flexible gears, not erase the old ones. The key is treat the wound that taught the brain to sprint, or it will keep sprinting even on an empty tank. So now let's tie it all together. How do we actually implement this in clinical practice? Imagine each patient's symptoms as a stack of chips in a casino. Red for sleep, blue for mood, green for focus. Textbooks treat them in separate rows, but real patients, their chips are mixed. My job isn't to force those chips back into neat rows. It's to read the wager and match the right medication or therapy to that exact combination. So what we do is we match circuit dysfunction to the clinical formulation, which then leads to the appropriate treatment. So let me show you some real world hands and how we actually pair biology with patient profile. So matchup one is wired and irritable. Here, we may simply need a mood stabilizer on the foundation, as that can both calm the individual and provide prefrontal cortex the strength it needs to kick into gear. Mood stabilizers such as lamotrigine or topiramate can work really well here. Matchup number two, wired and anxious. Once again, we've got to turn down the locus ceruleus firing. Here, we can either use prazosin or clonidine. On top of medication, we can add therapy for both matchup one and matchup two. Matchup three is flat and foggy. Here, we've got to kickstart the reward engine. This is about potentiating noradrenaline and dopamine just enough for the prefrontal cortex to grab the steering wheel again. Options include modafinil, r modafinil stimulants, an SNRI or bupropion. Then, and this is the part too many protocols skip, we loop back to the formulation. Who is this person? What shaped them? How do they read safety signals? That's where trauma therapy, schema therapy, sleep rewiring, anti-inflammatory choices, diet, lifestyle slot in. Skip the order and we're chasing shadows. So let me summarize all of this for you. If you've been waking up tired, foggy or wired, it might not be about sleeping more. It's about sleeping differently. It's about understanding that fatigue is not failure. It's feedback from your brain, from your history, from your wiring. It's your nervous system saying, I'm keeping you safe the only way I know how. But when we decode that, we then match symptoms 
to circuits. And when we match symptoms to circuits, we now have a path towards treatment. And this is why it becomes so important to consider the diagnostic hierarchy to understand what's driving the fatigue. This is exactly the sort of training that we cover in a lot more detail on the academy, in all our courses. Because when we apply this clinically, it's an extremely powerful tool. Understanding shapes solutions. If this video shifted your perspective, hit the like button. It tells the algorithm that this video matters. Share this video with someone that could benefit from this. And subscribe for more insights when neuroscience meets real life. I'm Dr. Sunil Reggie and see you in the next video. Until then, stay curious. Bye-bye.